Uh, hi, my name's Graham Webb and I live in the Darwin in the Northern Territory of Australia. And I guess I've been involved in crocodile research for nearly 50 years now. And I started off really as a, a zoologist, a herpetologist, interested in all different aspects of, of crocodiles and their biology because during the hunting period from 1945 to 71, there really hadn't been a lot learnt about saltwater crocodiles. And so I was fortunate to be in an area where uh, you were doing real pioneering research, where every day something new would happen. It's like going into a darkened room and switching a light on. Um, it was an exciting time. and. Uh, I was able to switch from working on saltwater crocodiles, then working on freshwater crocodiles, which are unique to Australia, and again, uh, do much of the same thing. At that time, this sort of equipped me pretty well internationally, because very few people had worked in depth on one species, let alone two species, and the conservation and management of crocodiles was um, becoming a global issue uh, here with saltwater crocodiles in particular they're, they're big and dangerous animals and so we had to explore different ways of managing them that um, so the public would would value them because you know ultimately conservation is about the actions we take to preserve and maintain things to which we attribute a positive value. Now we went down the path here of sustainable use. So we had a crocodile industry that employs people and generates income. And so the public see uh, crocodiles as an asset, which is of course the first step towards responsible action with conservation. Our problem is that the, the, the new generation of people coming in to manage crocodiles often don't know the institutional memory of what happened. So reasonably recently, we put together a, a history of how crocodiles have been managed and what happened during the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s to get us where we are today. You know, we're in a good position today. The population is sort of completely recovered, which is very difficult to achieve in uh, with the conservation of a predator. Uh, I think we've done a, a, a good job. It's still controversial because people still have difficulty uh, conserving and using a species, but really in conservation, there's, there's two words that um, sum it up and that's what works, you know, that sometimes things that you don't think are gonna work do work and sometimes things that you are convinced are going to work don't work. And science is as much involved in, in, in the management level of resolution as it is in um, studying individual parameters. So, look, I, I hope you enjoy the, the, the talk. It gives you some idea of how things have changed over time and we think the future will be good for crocodiles here. Thank you. Well, firstly, I'd like to thank the Crocodile Farmers Association of the Northern Territory who uh, supported this initiative to get the history together. And I'd also like to thank the thousands of people who have worked on saltwater crocodiles in the Northern Territory and have all contributed to uh, what we have today, which is a, a very good management program. Saltwater crocodiles are now abundant in the north and they're familiar to everybody. They're, they're big and they're dangerous and so everybody has to be pretty learned about them. But the history of, of management really goes way back to the Aboriginal people that up to at least 65,000 years ago, they were occupying inland areas they occupy today. But at that time, the sea level was 100 to 150 metres lower than it is today, so that 
uh, we were joined to Papua New Guinea and the coast of the Northern Territory was out near East Timor so that there appeared to be people inland but also no doubt people on the coast that were interacting with saltwater crocodiles and as the sea levels rose uh, moved inland with with the crocodiles so they've certainly had a long 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 um, association with crocodiles crocodiles are deeply ingrained into the uh, traditions and customs of these uh, hunter-gatherer people who didn't really develop agriculture as such and are just very, very, very skilled hunters in particular. And um, like Bill Magnuson, I was able to spend the early 70s uh, out with many of these traditional people and their institutional knowledge of, of, of crocodiles, their traditional knowledge is just really quite profound. However, the, one of the first non-Aboriginal people to report on crocodiles was Philip Parker King, one of Australia's great navigators, who visited the coast of the Northern Territory in 1818 to 1819. And in the Alligator Rivers region, he reported on how abundant uh, they were. Now, mind you, he called them alligators, but that was just a mistake. Um, and what was interesting is when he also surveyed the Liverpool River, which is 140 kilometres east of Kakadu, it was very clear that there were nowhere near the number of saltwater crocodiles that there were in the Alligator Rivers region. And um, this is important to realise that the densities were not the same everywhere. They were abundant in some areas and not in others. And you can get some idea there of where the Alligator River's region is, and the Liverpool River. They're not that far apart, but obviously those systems are sustaining, were sustaining different abundances of, of saltwater crocodiles. Another John McKinley in 1866, to give some idea, came down the East Alligator River in a boat they had to build out of, they had to kill their horses and uh, make a boat out of mangroves and tie the skins around. And his journals talk about continually having to fight off crocodiles coming down the East Alligator and out to sea and then around the coast um, be, because the smell of the rotting um, uh, uh, horse skins uh, was bringing in the crocodiles. So down in the south of uh, the coast, down in the Victoria River, you know, we have various encounters by Thomas Baines, who was another famous artist and explorer, uh, down in the Victoria River. And then in the Fitzmaurice River, which is close to the Victoria, uh, they had problems with horses. This was the first time these crocodiles had met horses and the first time probably the horses had met crocodiles. And so, you know, it was, again, a difficult thing for the early explorers to deal with. Um, the Fitzmaurice is and the Victoria are right down near the Western Australian border. The, the first <coughs> hunting of crocodiles sort of took place in association with the buffalo industry. The buffalo industry, the water buffalo were introduced to an early settlement in the north in, in back in the 1830s, uh, became feral uh, when that settlement closed and, and became very, very abundant because they damage the wetlands and they cause all sorts of problems. But their skins and horns were one of the key exports from the Northern Territory in the very, very early days. And some of the hunters, and this Paddy Carl was very well known, uh, referred to the fact on the East Alligator where they used to just, you know, shoot crocs for the fun of it, just as um, 
sport or recreation, and it didn't seem to have much of a uh, an impact on the populations. It was in, in a very small area, really, where the buffalo were, and uh, it it wasn't very significant. However, after World War II, the intense commercial hunting. Uh, was a different story where people systematically went from river to river with hunting crews and Aboriginal people were of course involved in them and and they would tend to get um, uh, you know about 20 you know eight foot crocs a night which is about all they could skin and handle and this went on and on and but very soon the easy crocodiles were gone and it became a more specialised task to get crocodiles in the freshwater swamps. The end result of this, and we, we did a very big review of this in 1984 where we interviewed some 60 people who'd been involved in the crocodile industry from us way back to the 1920s right through... Um, uh, the, the period of intense commercial hunting. And the original densities in different rivers were basically high, medium or low. And they, they weren't uniform. There wasn't uniform abundance everywhere. And that was very important to, to understand. The number of skins exported was about 113,000. But 87,000 of those went out between... 1946 and 58, and about 26,000 between 1959 and 1971. So in, in our opinion, the original NT population uh, in the 1940s was probably about 100,000 non-hatchlings, and it's actually uh, very close to that today, but that's a, a, another part of the story. So when they were protected in 1971, they, they had become really rare in areas where they'd once been common. And we, as we understand it today, there was a nucleus of wary adults, mostly well hidden and wary, perhaps 500. These were producing nests, so there was a few thousand hatchlings around, mainly some one-year-olds that hadn't been collected. So we think that the total population was maybe 3,000 to 5,000 individuals. But some rivers, especially the ones close to Darwin, uh, the Adelaide and the Mary rivers, were almost uh, completely free of crocs. They had been so intensively uh, hunted. So I guess when, after protection, this research era started up in the north, and it was largely due to Harry Messel and the University of Sydney program, which so many people worked, including myself. And that was just an amazing period because through the hunting period, very, very little in the way of formal research had been done. There was traditional knowledge, of course, by the hunters and indigenous people. All sorts of things were needed, you know, capture and handling techniques needed to be developed. Basic biology started to be studied and so uh, suddenly we, you know, we're getting information on nests and growth rates and foods and feeding and movement and dispersal and ages to maturity, behaviour, anatomy, physiology. There was just a mass of people working and uh, mainly through Harry Messel's program and it was a tremendous time, you know, we were learning so much so fast. So we started to monitor the rate at which the population was recovering because there was some question, they were so depleted as to whether they could recover, but they, they certainly did, and, and that recovery was well documented. And then the management issues started to come, you know, problem crocodiles, homing of crocodiles, uh, for the farming, suddenly needed to find out about incubation, sex determination, basic farm technologies. It was a, an incredible period of, of, of research. But one of the really interesting parts from a population point of view was we started to learn about just how dynamic these populations were. And so within 
the first 20 years after protection, it was very clear that uh, as the number of bigger crocodiles increased, the number of smaller ones was decreasing. So you basically had similar numbers of adults nesting, so the recruitment was about the same. It's just as the bigger crocs came into the river, they were starting to eat and displace the smaller ones, so that the rate of recovery was really being set by the crocodiles themselves. The whole pioneering of, of farming uh, started in 1979 with a, a, a single venture that was aimed at, at tourism and eventually at some sort of skin production. Um, and that created another whole uh, <clears throat> realm of research because that was a new industry and, and um, most agricultural industries have histories of five and 10,000 years, whereas Crocodile farming it all had to be learnt within a few decades. But the the object was to, to be able in the end to produce high quality skins, to make high quality leather, and, and, and that of course has been achieved over time. The biggest management issue in the north was we introduced a ranching program in the early 1980s uh, collecting wild eggs and using them to um, stock farms, pay the landowners for the eggs, so the landowners had a vested interest in in the crocodiles because they were generating money for them. That's Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal landowners. And what we found in the other work really was that um, there seemed to be a density dependent uh, mechanism operating on hatchling survival. So if you had a year in which there are a lot of nests hatched because a lot of nests flood and don't hatch, some years there's a lot, some years there's hardly any, but if you had a lot in the river, it seemed that very few survived, whereas if you didn't have very many, a high proportion of them survived. So, you know, there was a density-dependent mechanism, meaning that a lot of the eggs you could take um, didn't have any real impact on the population. Uh, of course, the whole issue of farming involved compliance with societies, and that was another whole learning curve for the Northern Territory. And that really came into this era of biopolitics through the through the nineteen eighties, where at that time. The crocodile specialist group was a very small group, but we're really totally opposed to the trade. And he suddenly found the territory, in order to be able to uh, introduce a program, had to really get active in, in um, not just the crocodile specialist group, but in the IUCN and within CITES itself, where... Uh, you know, we had to get permission from the parties to get saltwater crocodiles moved from Appendix 1 to Appendix 2 so we could bring in these programs. And that was a, a hugely complex undertaking. It's all history now, but it, um, there were all sorts of predictions of doom and gloom. But when you look at what actually has happened uh, as far as we can work it out, the population... Uh, in 19, the 1940s, if you assume that's 100%, got down to a very, very small level by the time they were protected. Like we think 99% of biomass would, had been taken. But the recovery um, was really quite dramatic. And even though we started ranching and collecting eggs, you can see that it, didn't really have any significant impact on anything. It, it just seems to be benign. Uh, so that was, a, a, you know, a really good thing. Not intuitive to many biologists because they sort of think if you have a thousand crocodiles and you, you know, you take a hundred eggs, that there's a hundred less crocodiles, and it goes. It doesn't work like that. 
Um, you know, these things have all sorts of mechanisms for adjusting. Anyway, as far as uh, our population goes, it was clearly uh, not only sustainable, but, but the whole idea of extinction or anything was out the door. They, they weren't going to go extinct as long as uh, people could keep the wild populations from being subject to intense commercial harvest. However, this ended up with a new problem because not only were we dealing with um, the conservation bureaucracy, we had to deal with the public. And saltwater crocodiles are big and dangerous animals and their management is, is seriously complicated, it has many, many, many issues associated with it. So the private sector and the public sector did work close together as, and, and, and continue to do so. And so there's just so many different issues that need, needed to be, um, the territory had to become expert in, in doing to manage the population, to manage the industry and to keep critics at bay because there's plenty of people that really just don't understand the whole issue of sustainable use and conservation benefit. One of the biggest issues, of course, was, was public education because this is so complicated where the people who live with crocodiles see a completely different animal than the people who live thousands of kilometres away. And remember, Australia uh, is 86% urban and most of the people uh, live well to the south of Darwin and, and the Northern Territory, you know, thousands of kilometres, and they just don't, they have real difficulty understanding uh, how your management has got to be for the people up here. It's got to be very pragmatic. You, 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 you can't make up stories or anything else. You just got to be very honest and very frank and very pragmatic. But you know, a huge public education program has operated up here and this is now undertaken through the government, uh, this B Crocwise program, and, and this special ads have been made to get out to Aboriginal people where they too had gone through a period where all the crocs were reduced in density through commercial hunting, and so there was a sort of gap in the traditional knowledge relative to the old days. So... You know, Aboriginal people were starting to get uh, attacked by crocs more often, so, so advertisements were made specifically for them. The other big issue that, that soon became apparent was that tourism associated with crocodiles was a big thing for the Northern Territory. We're a very big but sparsely populated uh, state that uh, we have 1.3 million square kilometres, but only 240,000 people. And tourism is our second biggest industry commercially, but our biggest employer of people. Mining is the main industry. So tourism is important. And in the top end of the Northern Territory, crocodiles are one of those features that really attract attention people just learn about crocodiles in the Northern Territory all around the world and, and, and it's reflected in people wanting to visit and crocodiles are a must-see attraction for people who who visit. You know, it, it, it's, it's, you, you can't come to Darwin and not go and see crocodiles. So there's many, many, many operations that exploit that tourism value of crocs. Uh, one of the, the key issues in the Northern Territory program is that something like 70% of the habitat in which crocs nest uh, uh, is owned by Aboriginal people. Aboriginal people own a huge percentage of all the land in the Northern Territory, probably at least three quarters. And up in the top end, many of the areas are owned by traditional people who um, they still have 
very, very, very much the traditional links with crocodiles. They've been working with the crocodile program, the ranching program for uh, many years, and they're now taking new steps to to get more employment and more commercial benefit from from crocodiles. This is this is an important element because um, so often with crocodiles, people at the bottom end of the food chain get get so little, and uh, this is all changing. So if you look at the future of the Northern Territory, the, there's, there's no doubt that the economic benefits crocodiles generate give the public incentives to support crocodile conservation management and sustainable use. Um, they, the public <laughs> often don't like crocodiles. Like if it, the thing is, if people are being employed and it's a centre of economic activity, even if you don't like them, you consider it worth uh, worth keeping a marine, on. And, and that's certainly what's happened up here. Uh, the biggest risk to that is, of course, the animal rights movement, which in Australia, with our 85, 86% urban, is they're opposed to any use of wildlife, even by Indigenous people. It's an ideological thing and it's gaining more and more political power down south and that that's a bit of a worry because if they get too much political power that would threaten our ability to have an industry uh, the benefits the industry provides to indigenous people in remote areas where, where there's very few opportunities for economic development has increasingly become important in, in identifying uh, in urban environments, uh, why our program is not only successful economically, it's successful from a conservation and management point of view and is something that um, really, you know, it's a bit of a model in some ways. So, you know, the, as an example of, of what goes on in 2021, the traditional Aboriginal people of Rum and Guinea at Narnam Land opened a new high-tech crocodile farm. They've been selling eggs from their lands to farmers since the mid-1980s, but this new initiative allows them to incubate and raise juveniles, increasing income and creating more employment. It's a great thing. So I'll just finish off this now, but with a a little uh, video of the opening of this thing and just how the traditional people see um, the issue. Thank you, thank you, Mop. We will invite you for this. For Crocodile Farm. It's not for us, but for the kids. So we'll, when we'll pass away, we'll set it up for them business. So when they go to school, when they come out from school, they got all the business here. They just go straight into this job. Farm or business is not easy. You gotta have knowledge. You gotta know who you're talking to. And to make them really good business, Everyone all talking, and everyone should be working in same like we go hunting. We we cook my paramandi. We all sit down and we share. Farm means to my granddaughter and grandsons to take them like for the new generation for the future. If I go like passed away, something's gonna happen for me. They will take a price for me. The farm means to people can work for their living and also helping them to get their money from, the, from work and also teach the children from the our children to take over. When I pass away, I let my grandson and granddaughter to come in to work 
Everybody have to come and join us now because we have to get this crocodile farm running and teach you how to handle this. You got something there to, to work. That's what that what this farm in, in, in set up to get Yulmo Mob going there and working with Balanda friends. And then looking at how, how they work because in two ways learning there, Yulmo gotta start to learn with new ways and we we opening door for other indigenous community about this this idea like small community um, um, enterprise. Start from here. If here I'm work, then yeah, you can do it. Let's move on.